Hello, this is the Metaphysical Podcast, Conversations and Partnership with the Seattle Metaphysical Library. I'm Laura, here with my guest co-host, Chris. We are very excited to be talking with a special guest today, all the way from Cambridge, England, Ian Wright. Ian is the author of the fascinating website, Dark Marxism, Adventures in Marxist Theory. Do you sometimes feel like an enchanted ragdoll? Would you be interested in a prolegomena to a demonology of capitalism? Please have a listen. Thank you, Ian, for joining us today. Uh, it's a huge pleasure. I've been a fan for a long time. Uh, I think that one of the things I wanted to start with was uh, mystification. And Marx and Marxists have talked for a long time about mystification and how our economy and the leaders of our economy and the people who work in sort of this capitalist mode of production have worked to mystify some of the elements of that. And I think one of the one of the roles that Marxists have is to demystify uh, some of those elements. I think that people have spiritually felt capital's effect on them, uh, both individually and collectively. And I think that Ian's work uh, helps us understand what that sort of spiritual feeling is, and while also covering sort of the material world that we live in. So I wanted to ask Ian first off. Uh, what is Marx's real God? Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Laura. Um, thanks for inviting me onto your podcast. Uh, I appreciate it. So, um, yeah, mystification. I mean, um, I mean, the most in, in the most general sense, uh, mystification is simply getting things wrong, and. Um, and science in the broadest sense is about trying to get things right. And so um, the Marxist tradition um, has always considered itself within the scientific tradition um, that, you know, spans um, centuries and centuries, and it, it's part of that tradition. And so um, the particular contribution of Marxism or one of the contributions of Marxism is, is applying essentially um, scientific um, methodology to understanding the society we live in. And that means taking essentially a sort of anthropological point of view on our own society, which can be very hard to do because we're born into our society and it works in certain ways, which we accept as natural and normal and appearance isn't coincidental with the state of affairs or what is actually happening. We need to look into deeper structures of society to, of the way society works in order to demystify and understand our society. So I just wanted to make that as a, you started to talk about mystification. So I wanted to just, Broad, put it in that broader framework. Yeah, and I think that there's something really truthful about that uh, because I feel like that there's a lot of people who understand that at sort of like a like they can't articulate how they feel, but they have that sort of uh, they they understand like what you're saying with with that mystification where uh, they feel like something's wrong, but they can't put their Put their finger on it they feel like there's something uh missing in their lives but they're just like not sure what it is the social relations we live in throw up certain kinds of mystifications mm -hmm. and different modes of production generate their own specific kinds of mystifications and um every society has its own kind of self-image which it uh how it understands itself but um you can't really take that on face value uh, because society, uh, social systems are highly complex, highly structured, and um, very complex. And so we have to really dig deep to understand precisely the nature of the society we're living in. So if I, if I, if I get to your question, which is, what is Marx's real God? Let's, let's, let's go for it and start. And Marx's real God is essentially the proposition that modern capitalist society isn't really a secular formation as we're led to believe. But it's a new kind of religious formation where we worship a God without really knowing it. So we're ruled by a hidden demiurge 
a kind of occulted God. We think we're living in a secular and commercial culture in general. We think economics is a very pragmatic and rational affair, but actually, no, that's not the reality of the situation. So that's quite counterintuitive. And so to understand it, we have to really take an anthropological viewpoint in our own society, and that's hard to do. It requires stepping out of our conceptual framework and looking at what we normally consider to be ordinary and accepted as unusual and questionable. So to explain what Marx's real God is, we need to first think about um, gods in general, I think. So of course, at different points in history, different geographical areas, people have formulated very different theories about God or gods. And we need to distinguish between our theories of gods and the proposed beings that those theories refer to and explain. There's the theories and then there's the entities themselves that the theories refer to. I want to consider these as separate things, as the religious belief systems themselves and the possible uh, truth content of those belief systems. Okay, so I want to focus on the content of the belief systems rather than their truth or falsity. Okay, so as we all know, gods in general are super mundane or superhuman entities and responsible for controlling aspects of reality, maybe all reality or you know, causing it originally. And we can interact with them in various ways. So perhaps the God we're most familiar with given our particular upbringing is the Christian God, all powerful, ultimately responsible for the whole of creation. But there are of course other religious traditions who believe in a different kind of God or multiple gods and so forth. Now, there are also people who don't believe in gods at all. And Marx is certainly someone that falls into uh, that category. And the Marxist tradition in general, I think, as everyone understands, is essentially you know, agnostic, atheist, um, a scientific materialist tradition, as I kind of mentioned. So when Marx talks of a real God, he's contrasting it with an unreal or imaginary God, which he would consider the Christian God to be, for instance. Now, all gods are imaginary in the sense that they are entities within belief systems that we hold in our collective imagination. But the contrast Marx is drawing between real and imaginary gods is simply that some gods are indeed purely fictitious entities where some actually exist. So it's, you know, it's pretty straightforward. And a real god exists even if no one believes in its existence. Its existence is independent of our beliefs. That's what a real, as opposed to an imaginary God, is. So I'm taking this very slowly. I hope that's okay. But no, that's uh, good. That's what he means by a, a real God. Now, what does he precisely mean by the real God of, of capitalism? Mm -hmm. um, now, I think it's important to note that imaginary gods do have their own kind of reality, of course, and it can be hugely significant in material terms. So in other words, belief systems, whatever their truth value, have real social consequences. Ideas are real, ideas have consequences. And this is where the occult uh, concept of an egregore uh, comes in. So an egregore is a non-physical entity that exists in virtue of our collective ritual activities of a group, yet it operates autonomously, has its own internal logic, and it can materially influence and control the group's activities. So the group creates the egregore, but then the egregore controls the group in a self-reinforcing feedback loop. And so all gods, um, whether they're real or imaginary, um, are personified egregores that their followers believe exist independently of them. So, um, you know, all Christians believe God truly exists. And if Christians um, decided not to believe that, uh, or many did, it, it'd still be the case that the belief system would hold that God, in fact, created the universe and exists, etc. So, you know, all those temples to the pagan gods, you know, the, all the uh, remains that um, decorate the modern landscape, you can go and visit they were built by minds fully committed to the reality 
of the pagan gods, all the great Christian cathedrals built at great cost to celebrate God's incarnation as Christ, built to truly celebrate that. You know, it's that's what people really think. Um, so egregores can have enormous consequences for human society, even if, and I don't want to pronounce on this, even if in some important sense, they may be entirely fictitious entities. Now, of course, other people believe them to be real, but I don't really, that's not important for our discussion today, I don't think. Um, uh, and yeah, just, just to be really clear for our listeners, was Mark saying that Christian and pagan gods and capital are all real in our minds, but Christian and pagan gods are not actually real, whereas capital is actually real? Yes, I think that's indeed okay. what he was uh, he was saying. And, and, and the reality of um, the real god of capitalism will, will try and make um, particularly concrete the reality okay. of it in the sense that the, because um, the real God is a culted, almost no one believes that it exists. It's, <laughs> but I it really does like. regardless of our beliefs. Okay, yeah. okay, so it's kind of an inversion of the normal relationship between a community and its egregore. Typically in religious belief systems, people know of the egregore and celebrate the egregore and worship it. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking with, like, I because I was having a conversation with with uh, several religious friends about the stock market, and they, you know, they they understand. It's kind of weird because I was talking with them about this, and I was saying, well, you know, you just treat it like it's some sort of like, it's almost talked about like it is a god, where it's like, oh, you know, uh, because the market is doing. Uh, this therefore we can we like our inflation is going down or something like that. there's there's not really a uh there's not really a, a concrete way of talking about it without sort of this this weird uh religious mystification right that's exactly right um there is a, a reification going on there is this thing be it the market be it wall street be it the economy that exists independently of us and over and above us that uh, somehow judges all our activities, but no particular individuals in control of it, it seems. And um, But of course, the language used to describe economic phenomena is highly secular and uh, presents itself as something that's, that almost has you know, pragmatic, instrumental, scientific rationality to it. It, you know, it cannot be argued with. It's just common sense. It's, it's supply and demand. It's how, how the world works. Right. Uh, yeah. And um, but this is part of uh, the myth of disenchantment that occurred with the rise of industrial capitalism, which was, you know, we're, we're, we're getting beyond the superstition of uh, the medieval superstition and uh, the antique superstition in God and gods. Capitalism is is a, is a rational and secular affair. We're putting that behind us. The world is becoming disenchanted. But I think that's actually a myth. And capitalism was a kind of new dark enchantment where really rather than putting behind us sacrificial religions, it was an entirely new form of a sacrificial religion, hiding in secular clothing in order to demark itself into an, an, and create a new realm of economic activity separate from religious concerns that went before. So we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves there. But yes, you're totally right to bring up this, this kind of language that's used in, in normal discourse, which gives a very good hint that um, our... Um, our relations between ourselves are entirely alienated and given over to something else that's above and beyond us. Right. And there's something the, the uh, like I was talking with a friend of mine again about this sort of thing. And it immediately, when you get into arguing about like, well, why does the market say that it almost kind of, it almost shuts down the conversation in a lot of ways, because a lot of people just go, well, like what you're saying, well, I don't know. I mean, it's just the market. It's just supply and demand. Mm-hmm. I like how you put the economy in air quotes because I know economics is considered a social science, but um, when people talk about it, do you think that they think that they're talking about something scientific when actually clearly they're talking about more of a, a non-existent God? <laughs> you know, scientific fields and social phenomena are very complicated things and it's, 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 it's wrong to give very black and white answers. So there is real scientific content to the field of economics it's not complete crap it does we do, do right. live in a shared social world and we do talk about the same phenomena and many of the things that it says are um 
um, you know, identify true true laws of economics and the correct empirical generalizations, etc. It's not complete nonsense, but it's it's kind of the absences, the absences yeah. feel that are actually significant. It's always more difficult to notice absences than presence, mm -hmm. and it's what economics does not mention and does not talk about and does not see. That's actually uh, um, um, its its limitations as a scientific enterprise. Um, so. I, I, we still haven't really um, answered what Marx means by uh, a real God. And um, so Marx uses this phrase in some um, notes on the liberal philosopher James Mill uh, written in 1844. That's when he first uses this term and he uses it very rarely in its writing. You know, it's, so it's kind of like um, it's a sudden eruption of religious language, which happens across all Marx's works throughout his, his lifetime, but sometimes it's more acute. And this is a particularly acute eruption of religious language in, in, in Marx's theory. And um, he, he introduces the phrase when he's talking about money. But Marx's real God is not a God of money. He's not simply talking about the worship of material goods or worship of money or pe how people have been corrupted by greed and are selfish and all that kind of stuff. That is an aspect of it, but love of money is an individual psychological attitude. And Marx's real God is not reducible to individual beliefs or individual psychology. And really, on the contrary, Marx's real God is an objective social entity that helps to create and form such attitudes in us. We are, we are partially, in fact, created by the egregore. What we think and what we do creates the kind of people that we are. And so... It, it's it's not just simply um, a god of money. It's it's it's, it's way more um, um, sophisticated uh, than that. So, Marx proposes that in modern capitalist societies, our collective economic activity instantiates emergent economic laws, which operate quite independently of our individual beliefs. And these laws stand above and beyond us. And some of those laws are indeed reflected in in normal economics. So, in other words. No human or collection of humans is really in control of the global capitalist economy. Something else is in control, and it's this emergent entity or egregore, which we're typically completely unaware of. And to really understand the content of that real goal, we need to understand essentially two things. What economic value really is, that's a big topic, and also have some appreciation of uh, control theory, which is the scientific theory of how systems of all different kinds can pursue their own goals autonomously and control aspects of their environment. And I think a good starting point to understand Marx's real God is with control systems. Scientific progress um, sometimes consists in organizing a whole range of different phenomena under a single uh, principle. And the emergence of cybernetics uh, around the early 20th century is an example of that. And the core idea of cybernetics is that many different kinds of systems, it can be mechanical systems, physical, biological, cognitive systems, and social systems exhibit a particular kind of causal structure called the negative feedback control loop. Now, we can consider a very simple mundane example of such a thing, which would be a thermostat in your home, which controls the temperature of, of, a, of your room. So you can set the system's goal by uh, fiddling with the temperature setting. The thermometer component of the system measures the room's temperature. It then compares the measured temperature to its goal state, turns the heating on if uh, it's too low, turns the heating off if it's too high. And in that way, it will autonomously control the room and the temperature. It will keep achieving that goal of whatever temperature you've set without you ever having to touch it again. And that's a simple example of a negative feedback control system. They're ubiquitous, they're everywhere, both in the artificial machinery that we create and in nature. So for example, the temperature of our bodies is controlled by a very similar kind of biological feedback mechanism, except the homeostatic mechanism isn't implemented in terms of metal wires and plastic, but actually in terms of nerves, enzymes, sweat glands, and so forth. So, Control systems are everywhere. Now, 
control systems very interesting in themselves through autonomous entities that represent parts of their environment. Um, and um, and in order, they represent parts of the environment in order to control aspects of the environment in which they're embedded. They're goal-directed entities. And they can be really simple, like a thermostat, or they can be really complex, really complex, like, say, the, an animal brain, which is a, a highly elaborate form of a control system. So perhaps unsurprisingly, given what we've been talking about, there's a very significant control loop hiding in plain sight that affects every aspect of modern life in the most profound and intimate way. And to see it, we need to understand a little bit of economics. So there's a social control system we need to talk about. So we need a little bit of economics. So the basic institution of production in our society is the capitalist firm. And I say the capitalist firm because there are different kinds of firms that can exist. And a capitalist firm is a particular kind of one. It happens to be the by far and away the majority type of institution of production in our society, the capitalist firm. The vast majority of firms are composed of two groups of people. Those that supply labor and get paid a wage. Those that supply capital receive profit. So capitalist owners extract profit from the firm. They can only spend a fraction of their profits on personal luxury consumption because if they spend all their profit on themselves, their capital would rapidly diminish compared to other capitalists who invested their profit in further profitable activities. And this is a basic imperative. You've got to reinvest your profit income in order to make more profit. If you don't, you'll cease to be a capital altogether. So that's the prime directive due to capitalist competition for anyone who possesses a capital sum of money. And so all these individual private capitals big and small ones, um, small amounts of capital, huge amounts of capital, they all max. They all have to hedge their bets over risk. So they have a portfolio of investments and they have to maximize the returns over that por portfolio. And it's right here, it's right here where most of the um, resources and assets in the global economy are privately owned by capitals, individual capitals competing with each other, where we find the causal structure of a negative feedback control loop. So an individual circuit of profitable investment, when we view it as a, as a supra individual social practice, composed of lots of different people doing lots of different things, actually has its own goal state, its own sensory inputs, its own decision-making, and its ability to act upon the world in which it's embedded. Now, this social practice is of course implemented through individuals and their individual decision-making and their actions of large collections of people, but it's not reducible to those individual decisions and actions. It's an emergent, purely social phenomenon. It's a social practice, a collective social practice. And this is the basic uh, feedback structure. The goal of the individual capital is to maximize profits, the sensory inputs, the different profit rates measured across the portfolio, and the human capitalist, or the financial experts they employ, compare these different profit rates. And this is the decision-making part. And the, the, the feedback loop is closed by financial activities that withdraw capital from poorly performing investments and inject capital into high performing investments. And that social practice instantiates a control system, which is an insatiable and ceaseless desire for profit. So at the commanding heights of the global economy, find enormous collection of individual capitals, each manically scrambling for profit, reacting to these profit rate signals received from, in a sense, its tendrils that extend to every productive activity that it owns or partially owns. Each capital withdraws, injects its money from different industrial sectors, geographical regions. So the entirety of the world's material resources, including the working time of billions and billions of us, are repeatedly marshaled and remarshaled away from low and towards high profit activities. So, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, I think that's why you see, and especially I think that there's a lot of people out there who understand that money is, is being kind of coalesced into smaller and smaller and smaller groups of people. And I think when, when we're thinking about that control group of profitability, there, when somebody loses, it has to go where the most profit is available. 
And so whoever has that mechanism that can produce the most profit or whoever is responding to that control system will get that capital, will get that money. And so capital and money are, are slowly but surely kind of being formed into smaller and smaller, are, are being collected into smaller and smaller groups of people. There's a, yes, there's, um, in terms of the dynamics of the process and the generation of income and wealth inequality, um, there is, there is a, <clears throat> there is a tendency for capitals to uh, become big monopolies and get and, and small them to get really big, but at the same time, lots of individual capitals, especially the smaller ones, can can completely fail and they can diminish in size. And so, what you essentially find in um, empirical reality is what's called a, a power law of uh, a district power law distribution of uh, sizes of capital. So you have a tiny number of absolutely astronomically huge capitals. The Bill Gates and the Jeff Bezos of the world, they are sitting on top of enormous sums of money beyond our, our imagining, beyond our imagining, and way, way bigger than the next capitalist down in the pecking order, you know, that's really stretched out. And then there's a, a, a huge number of actually quite small capitals. And when you and you get down in the weeds, you're even talking about personal savings of the middle class, um, but they're they're tiny in comparison. So it's this huge inequality in, in the system in that sense. Yeah, absolutely. So and 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 actually, that's a good point, which is we need to distinguish between capitals and and the capitalists because capitals can actually live much longer than any individual human that, that owns them. So the people controlled by the capital, that's that's the workers that supply labor to firms owned by the capital. And capitalists that extract the profits, they're in essence mere replaceable components of this social control loop. They mechanically perform these allotted social roles. And so we, you know, we normally say a capitalist possesses capital, but it's actually more accurate to say that a capital possesses them. Because we're all subject to this impersonal domination by this egregore, by this social practice, by the rules of the economic game, by these objective economic laws that no one actually controls, that we all kind of slavishly follow like enchanted ragdolls in many ways. Yeah, that's one thing that when I was first kind of beginning to study Marxism, I thought that the rich or like that the very powerful had control over these things. But it was so enlightening to learn like, no, they're, they have to respond to this negative control system that you mentioned earlier. They don't have control over it. Uh, it, it it's actually controlling them. It, yes, uh, it is. Um, but um, it's much better to be a capitalist than a worker. Uh, so if if you are fully possessed by capital, um, and, I, and I think uh, possession is, is the right word, uh, because um, people with a lot of capital... Um, they spend a lot of time maintaining it. You know, it affects what they actually do day to day. Having said that, um, by being um, possessed representatives of capital, the kind of the visible hands of the real God, um, they get richly rewarded. You know, they can't spend everything on luxury consumption, but my God, they do spend quite a lot and their lives are completely different to ours. And so they can earn more than a, a normal wage worker can in a year, they can they can own it at night while they're asleep. Um, so um, they are subject to the the rule of of capital, but they are exalted ones in the system compared to the vast majority of the population. Yeah. So um, so. That's, I think that's a good, good point where I can finally answer your question, I think, which is Marx's real God is real precisely because the social practice of capitalist competition and accumulation is real. But our imaginations haven't quite cut, caught up with our own social practice. So we act largely unconsciously, blindly following these social rules that we accept as entirely natural and rational. But there are very many important consequences of living under the rule of capital, which are very bad consequences for human relations, both in the small and in the large. 
And there's a huge amount of irrationality in our social practice, which we um, um, don't always see, but we really need to. So I think I should stop there. But hopefully that's given you some idea of Marx's concept of, of a real God that's controlling our lives. Yeah, I think that does a really good job of, of building up to what uh, Marx's real God is. Earlier, you mentioned uh, that what we think and what we do make who we are. And I, I think that that kind of transitions us into another question, one that's a little bit more geared towards metaphysics, which is, in general, metaphysics is a study of being and ontology. And I think that one of the things that this Marx's is real God kind of raises this question of uh, is how can we kind of determine that answer when it feels like what we think and what we do, well, not necessarily what we think, but what we do is, is almost kind of predetermined, not in like a specific sense of like, you're a ditch digger, you're a manager, you're a uh, uh, social worker, but it's kind of determined in that you will have to work within this uh, control system. And so how can one even begin to answer that question? Uh, like who we are and what do we do? I don't think there's really a, a profound um, philosophical uh, conundrum here about uh, the relationship between um, what freedom we may have and, and what lack of it, you know, how much is in fact determined and how much is open to our own free will. Because, I mean, reality is a combination of, of freedom and necessity. And by that, I mean, we do have freedom to make decisions, but within a space of possibilities and the necessity is often or almost always is that we we don't choose that space of possibilities rather we choose be, you know from that space which is determined by material and social conditions that are not under our control so we have choice but it's a, a choice that's uh, from a limited menu of things that is uh, controlled by um, causal factors bigger than us uh, than the individual person but we always have a, a, a wiggle room. So Marx, uh, in a famous quote, expresses this, I think, very eloquently better than I can. So um, I won't give you many quotes today, but this is a good one. So here we go. Um, Marx says, and uh, apologies for the Victorian uh, sexist language, but Marx says, men make their own history, but they do not make it just as they please. They do not make it under circumstances chosen by themselves, but under circumstances directly encountered, given and transmitted from the past. The tradition of all the dead generations weighs like a nightmare on the brain of the living, end quote. And um, you know, we, we don't choose the circumstances we're born into, and that affects the kind of, you know, as I said earlier, the, the real God creates attitudes and beliefs and behaviors. It creates kinds of human beings. We, we ourselves can't escape from the historical circumstances we're born into. If we were born 300 years ago, we'd have a very different set of beliefs. Um, but we're not stupid. We have wiggle room. We can learn and we can understand and we can change things. So, and, and one way to, in fact, expand the space of possibilities we can choose from is to gain a deep understanding of our social reality, which is, part of what, um, um, what what we're discussing, basically. So, you know, the best kind of prison is the one you don't think you're actually in. And most people don't see themselves as subjects of a real God that dominates and exploits them. They just don't see it. So the first step, you know, to, to gaining some freedom, to avoid being controlled by this demiurge, capital, is to realize that you are, in fact, controlled by it. And that requires cutting through a lot of economic and political ideology to get at the true nature of the social system that we've been born into. But, you know, I think I'd be given a completely false impression of our society if I gave the idea that, <clears throat> you know, the control and domination of the real God is complete and absolute. That's not the case at all. You know, we're all driven by goals other than the purely economic, uh, we love our family and friends, care for our neighbors. We have spontaneous uh, empathy. 
we can recognize right from wrong. And we, we do, in fact, try to help each other in an enormous variety of ways in, in civil society. And I think the clearest and most important example that I can think of at the moment of our rebellion against the rule of capital is the existence of political democracy. So, you know, politics under the rule of capital, you know, it has enormous limitations. It's typically corrupted by wealthy interests. It's partially possessed by the real God itself. But nonetheless, the idea of democracy where every person can vote, every person is considered equal, one person, one vote, regardless of our economic worth in the eyes of the real God, whether we're able to work or not, you know, that's a social practice that fundamentally opposes the rule of capital. And a great deal of politics, in fact, involves redistributing society's resources from the better off to the needy. And that's a great example of how, despite the domination by the rules of capital, we do, in fact, retain some of our human humanity, you know, we're not fully possessed. So we have to view our subordination to the real God as constraining and limiting the possibilities for human flourishing, but it doesn't fully control us. It doesn't fully determine what we are and what we do. There's always wiggle room. Yeah, I was actually going to say, I'm not super familiar with uh, British economics, but I've been doing a lot of studying in American economics, especially in the, in the, in the turn of the, the beginning in pre-World War II, um, partly because I think you're right. There are a lot of mechanisms that we can use to control uh, capital. And one of the things that I think that um, one of the things that I think that FDR did was instituting both the New Deal and centralizing the economy for uh, the purposes of World War II, because that ushered in a whole new level of industrialization in America. And uh, because of the wildcat strikes that happened right after World War II, there was a lot of a lot more economic freedom that that uh, was given to uh, people in the working class in America. Everything from the eight-hour workday to weekends to all of these things that, like what you say, uh, we want to do. We don't want to just be pawns in an economic, you know, system. We want to have lives with our families and lives with, uh, you know outside of capital where we can do things that we enjoy doing and not just, you know, uh, working in a factory or working in an office. Right. Yeah. So, you know, we take it for granted that there are two separate realms of politics and economics. And um, really the fact that there is two separate sort of um, realms indicates that the rule, the uh, capitalism as a pure economic system isn't really viable and in, and in fact causes all kinds of problems that have to be remedied by politics and so you know the marxist tradition views the political domain as a domain of of, of class struggle politics is again a very complex social phenomenon you can't simply and easily always reduce it to two contending classes that link to kinds of income but it is highly explanatory and um, it is one of the um, you know, biggest signals driving uh, the uh, phenomena of, of, of politics. And the kind of um, New Deal phenomena that you were discussing there is, is, a, is, a, is an example of precisely when uh, the working majority in the US through, correct me if I'm wrong, through the Democratic Party um, um, in a post-war consensus after a, you know, a terrible um, World War managed to wrest some control from capital and capitalists uh, into the form of the state uh, to redistribute resources and try and organize the economy on more rational lines. Um, that's absolutely the case. Yeah. Yeah. You are right. It was the Democratic Party. And unfortunately, because of a multitude of reasons, it has now basically become totally untethered with any sort of labor politics. But that, that's for another time. It's unfortunate that that happened, but it is for another time. It's kind of interesting because you said, uh, at least a little bit previously, like once people see that they are subject to a God uh, or to this God, but once people see that they are subject to this God, they might have a, a question of how is this God or demon or entity summoned? Because uh, in your writings, you talk a little bit about um, 
how this this control system that we do we live in or the god um is is summoned via sort of an establishment of property rights coercion and control and contracts and i was wondering if you could go a little bit further into that i might take a roundabout way to get there but i'll I'll try so so you mentioned um demons uh demonic power right um so so in, in mythology demons are you know anarchic uh out of control entities that cause us harm to tormenting us or possessing us making us ill you know that's that kind of thing that's what demons that's what demons do so this real god that we've been talking about not only is its power um titanic you know, spanning the globe controlling the world but it's also demonic in that precise sense you know it does create um social ills that aren't necessary they are purely due to our unconscious and unthinking worship of it. So I, I think it's worth, you know, because one response to the kind of things we've been talking about would be, sure, we're controlled by a real God. So what? <laughs> Maybe it's fine. And um, so I think it's worth pointing out precisely why it's not fine at all. And it is demonic. Um, so I'm glad you brought in this idea of, of uh, essentially evil of a kind. Um, so, you know, every day, Millions of workers around the globe have no choice but to sacrifice their time, uh, their vi- vi- vitality to produce profit for the, for the real God. And no matter, so that means that no matter how long or how hard or efficiently we work, this imperative to work always remains. And why? Because every labor saving technical innovation takes the form of profit, and that's captured by individual capitals. And because of this imperative of competition, that profit is immediately reinjected into the material world to animate new activities for further profit. So that means that despite huge advances in automation over hundreds of years, the working day remains as long as it ever has. Uh, we could take another example, right? So the real God demands maximum profit extraction from firms, and that means minimizing wages. So those capitalists, they can live an exalted existence, have a luxury lifestyle, but the majority of the world, the dispossessed, so to speak, which don't possess capital, we must feed, clothe, maintain ourselves and a home. And I think I worked this out um, a year or so ago on an average income globally of roughly $10 a day. So there's enormous wealth inequality which causes unnecessary suffering and hardship. A few have way too much, and most have way, way too little. Another example, we're all subject to the whims of the business cycle and periodic economic crises. So these recessions can throw large numbers of workers out of work through no fault of their own. Suddenly bills can't be paid, families thrown out onto the street. Why? Because the real God, is a blind God. All it sees is economic value. All it sees is differential returns across a portfolio of investments. All it sees is abstract value. That's all it cares about. That's all it can care about. It doesn't see us. So profits can be great, even if unemployment is high and human misery spills out onto the streets. Real God just doesn't care. And, um, you know, it doesn't only harm our lives, it also harms our environment. This imperative for continual accumulation, more production, more investment, more profit, means that the environment is is plundered um, and anything that's not yet owned by capital is plundered for free and without re- replacement. It's primitive accumulation. And this plundering is profitable, it doesn't stop, it can't stop because the ultimate good is profit, nothing gets in its way. Um, we can say so much more here. Capitalism means the complete absence of bottom-up democracy in our workplaces. We think we live in democracies, but every capitalist firm is a mini dictatorship. Dominant capitals capture our political institutions, capture the politicians who supposedly represent our interests. And this universal competition of private capitals leads to universal economic competition between nation states, 
where wealthy countries compete with each other to protect and enlarge their domain, property and power. And this dynamic has a tendency to erupt into war and violence, which is unfortunately very, very um, germane at the moment as we're talking. Ordinary workers end up fighting and killing each other for the sake of the same real God, but doing it beneath different national flags. That's utterly, utterly irrational. So, you know, we can reduce it down to something really basic, this kind of irrationality. You know, there's plenty of building materials. There's plenty of builders, many are unemployed, and there's homeless people on the streets. It's an increasing problem in the UK. I've lived in America. It's, you know, it's a big problem in many of the big cities in, in America. It's, it's tragic. There's no scarcity of builders or building materials or homeless people, but no one cares and nothing's done about it. In the richest countries, there are young children going hungry, and that's because capitalist societies are not organized around the common good, but private profit. So we just keep performing our allotted social roles, thinking it's normal and okay. So this real God is de demonic. It's an unloving God. And um, you mentioned uh, summoning. How is this God uh, uh, summoned? And this question is really about the um, historical circumstances that gave rise to the uh, capitalist mode of, of production. And so, you know, we can't, you know, it's a huge topic, but, very, you know, very briefly, after a few false starts in Italian city-states, uh, capitalism emerged in the um, you know, 17th and 18th centuries, and that's when the real God was really summoned into existence. And um, I can speak more to Britain um, just because, you know, I, I've lived here and I have a, a bit of better understanding of it. But in Britain during that period, large numbers of peasants were thrown off the land into workshops uh, and factories in the cities. These new institutions, these capitalist firms, began to command hundreds of laborers to produce commodities explicitly intended for sale in the market. Um, scientific rationality was applied to the production process. Competition between firms stimulated the application of machinery um, that significantly increased the productivity of labor. Profits reinvested in more production. The population of wage laborers exploded. You know, there was a time when it was mainly agricultural workers in Britain that completely changed very quickly in a matter of a few generations. Explosion of wage workers in terms of, in, in terms of demographics. And this became a fungible resource that could be deployed and redeployed to different economic ends. And this revolution in the social relations of production, this new kind of society that emerged meant that the British ruling class, they became you know, rich from colonial conquest, direct enslavement of millions in plantations abroad and the exploitation of millions of workers at home. And this new way of organizing production was just much more dynamic, more rapacious, ultimately led to more real material progress and power for the capitals and therefore spread like wildfire across the globe. This new cult spread like wildfire across the globe, not unlike the original spread of the Christian cult through the Roman Empire uh, millennia ago. It was, it was a real runaway process. And this demon, once summoned, is like the genie escaped from the bottle. No putting it back now. Um, so... So right now, you know, 2022, majority of the world's production takes place in capitalist conditions. There's a huge class of workers that sell their labor for a, a rental fee called a wage. Um, and it's considered okay to rent out human beings in the market who get no claim on the profits they create. And it's considered okay that this wealthy minority extracts those profits by purely owning the firm. So um, ultimately, it's private capitals controlling the world's resources and competing with each other and with the power to rent workers in a labor market and take the profits that summons this real God into existence. Right, that makes, that makes a lot of sense to me. 
if if there's ever like a point that people should need to pause and think about something that I, I'm encouraging them to do so because oftentimes when I'm reading uh, dense material I have to like take a break from it for five ten minutes and just think to myself of like how to like or go back over the material and really begin to understand it that way but I'm gonna need to uh, probably ask only maybe like one or two more questions because I gotta. Uh, I got to take care of my wife. She's very pregnant right now. So I want to make sure to keep to tending to what she needs. So Congratulations, by the way, Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's a crazy story of how it actually happened, but <laughs> isn't it the same story as it always happens? <laughs> well, you know, I mean, yes, but there's, yeah. there's, there's a pretty crazy story behind it, but um, it was extra special for them. So it was, it was, but uh, anyways, for the last uh, couple of questions, I'm kind of trying to, to trying to structure this in a way of like helping people become aware of the God, helping people see like where it originated, which bringing up the enclosure period uh, is, is a good place to start too for people's like historical understanding of how capitalism came to be. Cause I feel like a lot of, a lot of my conversations with people who uh, understand capitalism is just like sort of this uh, economic thing. They just kind of assume that it has always been there. Like they're just like, Oh, well, capitalism was just always here. It just, it just wasn't exactly capitalism before it became capitalism now. Um, so helping people understand like, no, there was a historical shift from feudalism into capitalism is, is really helpful because a lot of people just assume its existence. Um, but once people kind of understand that there is this real God and understand that there is some, uh, uh, there is some way that it came about in the world, I feel like people are going to ask themselves, well, I feel like it's been terrible for me as a worker to work in the system. I have to uh, do a tremendous amount just to live or even somebody in sort of more of a middle-class setting saying like, I, I work at a difficult job and I am underpaid and I'm trying to do my best, but I, I'm just not treated well at my workplace. Uh, I, I feel like at this point, they're going to wonder like, well, what can we do to sort of reverse the summoning? And I think that sort of a more like scientific question is what can we do to take control over this control system that we live under? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> I love that question. <laughs> People have been uh, trying to answer this for a very long time, but, you know, it's, it's good right. to at least discuss it. Right, right, right. So um, let me um, let me try and collect my thoughts. So how can we um, overthrow and abolish God? That's that's the question. Now, anyone with any understanding of um, um, political history um, and the Marxist tradition knows and and not just the mark the, the socialist tradition and more generally um the history of that and the anarchist tradition know there's been an enormous variety of attempts to try and overthrow this real god to overthrow capitalism and replace it with something better so um this is a story of um and the history of working class politics um and there is innovation in politics, there is innovation in, in history. And if we turn the clock back to the very beginnings of capitalism and the emergence of the working class, right at the beginning, you see the emergence of uh, new working class institutions to try and um, defend their, their interests and uh, change things for, for, the, for the better. So it's a very rich history. There's the history of the... Um, International again, ap apologies for the Victorian sexism. The International Working Men's Association uh, that uh, Marx and, and anarchists set up originally, um, trade unionism, of course, uh, the various um, utopian experiments of um, the kind of the enlightened bourgeoisie um, who um, you know created co-ops and profit-sharing schemes and. Even the, the, I don't know, if, uh, I think uh, building societies in, 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 in Britain are an example of working class people trying to avoid the banks but save their money together. Uh, I think they're called credit unions. Um, uh, and then there's also obviously political parties. There's, um, you know, reformist political parties, 
um, like the Labour Party in the UK, which has links to the trade unions. And uh, there's the revolutionary parties, um, you know, the Marxist Leninist style revolutionary parties or anarchist parties were, who um, don't think um, that reformism is, is, is viable. Incredibly rich tradition, right? And um, depending on your point of view, there's been some successes and some big failures. Um, and so here's here's something to to add to that um, to those uh, that, that big picture, right? Um, to overthrow the real god is identical to um, um, abolishing circuits of capital accumulation. It's abolishing the organization of our economic activity by private competing capitals. And it means abolishing the social roles of worker and capitalist. And that means having institutions where production takes place, where economic activity takes place, where people are not sorted into two classes of people, those that earn wages and those that, those that get the profits. And so to abolish the real God does mean fundamentally a revolution in our social relations of production in what what is allowed to be owned and what is not so for example uh in capitalist societies uh direct slavery is illegal i mean it does happen at the periphery it does certainly happen but it's it's not meant to happen and it's stamped out uh normally it's it's illegal you can't you can't have a slave anymore you could for millennia in human history but you can't anymore. Now, but you can rent people. You can rent people for a wage, get them to work. They produce more value than what their wage costs and take the profits for yourself. That is allowed. That property relationship is allowed. It shouldn't be. There shouldn't be rental markets for human beings. And the best example of how to abolish that on a small scale, it's, this won't be sufficient, but this is a, we don't have to use our imagination here. There are already examples of that. So workers' cooperatives, which exist in all capitalist societies, are examples where they're bottom-up, if, if they're good ones and well-organized, they're bottom-up democracies where all workers have equal votes in how the companies run, they elect their bosses, and they share the profits and in that sense, in that local sense, they are not exploited and there isn't two classes of people uh, to, to make things, to produce things. And if that was uh, generalized and um, if capital wasn't privately owned but socially owned, so all the major capital assets in the economy were owned commonly by everyone and democratically controlled and allocated, um, and profits shared universally, then, then we're beginning to abolish the real God. And the question is, how do we get there? There's loads and loads of barriers to that, obviously. For example, just as an aside, um, the death rate of cooperatives compared to capitalist firms is essentially very similar. So once a co-op is up and running, it's not a disadvantage really to a capitalist firm, but the birth rate of co-ops is minuscule compared to the birth rate of capitalist firms. And there's very clear and obvious reasons why that would be because those with capital will not invest to st uh, a co-op because they can't have equity. They can't own the firm. They just could, they could lo loan capital out, but once that's repaid, the co-op's free of the, uh, of the rule of, of, of that capital. Now, they, no, people with capital wants to own that firm in perpetuity, even when their initial capital is paid off. So that's why co-ops, don't spontaneously get birthed in capitalist society. They're structurally prevented from doing so. So I think it's not too difficult to imagine, of course, we should talk about it more, we don't have time, but it's not actually too difficult to imagine a economic system, not that different from ours, where the, the um, economy is democratically controlled for the benefit of all. That's not too hard to imagine. What the difficulty is, is how do we get there? And that problem has yet to be solved. That's a historical problem that we all face. And we need to really start you know, thinking about people already, you know, 
that's a tradition of working class politics. There's a lot of history that goes into working class politics that I think people people should dive into. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of history there uh, from 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 even to the enclosure period up to now that have kind of helped determine why we're at labor wise, uh, why we are at this historical moment. And so I think that if I'm going to encourage the listeners to go and learn anything, go go and learn about labor politics uh, in, in, especially at a local level, because at the local level, you know, you may not be able to control your national politic, uh, but you can at least make a, make a difference at the local level. Like if you see, if you, like, I know in, um, oh, I can't remember where the, there was a latest strike for, uh, Kellogg's in the United States. And I know that some people, um, within organizations that I know of, we're going to help those people. And, uh, I know that, uh, you know, when, when there's, striking workers for for the i know and where i live uh, especially it's nurses around here it's always good to like go and see what you can do to support uh things like that or like you know if you if you feel like you could run for local office i mean by god do so we need we need different people in there i, I totally um agree with your um call for people to uh learn working class history uh because it, it's it's something you have to search out you're not going to be told it um, spontaneously at, at school or even by your typical political representatives. It's something you've got to search out and understand. I would also add, though, that um, we have to generalize from, from the historical record, right? And uh, this is my personal opinion. I don't know how widely it, it, it's shared, but there's a tendency on the left to be actually quite conservative and traditional and keep repeating the same methods of political organization and rebellion that have shown to repeatedly fail. So um, without being disrespectful to all the enormous efforts that people are doing um, in the traditional working class organizations, that'd be the trade unions, reformers, political parties, revolutionary parties, we have to take a step back and think for a moment and just realize that we're actually not really getting very far, especially in, in, in the rich countries. So I think we have to be honest about that. And really, for those who are interested and willing to do it, to really think deeply about what we're getting wrong and what actually might be missing from, because as I mentioned, every thing I mentioned, every working class institution, trade unions, cooperatives, et cetera, were innovated, they were invented at one point in history. And invention never ends. We can still have still things to discover and find out and creative ways of organizing ourselves. I don't have the answer to that, but I think um, I feel there's something missing. There's something missing that we're not getting right. And I don't have the answer, but I think it's important. There's kind of pluralism on the left and there needs to be space for people to think about that and ask that question. Um, yeah. That's what I want to say about it. No, that's absolutely true. I mean, there have been a lot of uh, movement forwards and a lot of setbacks that that are really well worth reflecting on. Well, I think a little earlier you said um, democracy is very limited in capitalism. And it kind of made me think about, you know, when there's student body presidents in like elementary school and they run for president, but they have zero power and they can't actually change any policy in their school. It just made me think of that and how in the political climate lately, definitely in the US, but I think everywhere, there's a lot of conspiracy theory along the lines of um, uh, we're being secretly controlled by the government in ways that we don't know about, right? Um, and I see that as like very unhealthy, <laughs> but um, that leads me to my question, just wondering where you'll go with this. Um, do you think Marx was a conspiracy theorist? <laughs> he certainly conspired on occasion but he i don't think he was a no 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 he wasn't a conspiracy theorist no 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 so yeah i mean um it seems to me conspiracy theories are um now <laughs> are they on the rise or is it the rise of the internet that has given us insight into our neighbors' thoughts? And my God, we've been a bit shocked. Um, 
I think it's a bit a bit of both, is that before we didn't know what other people were thinking and they kept it to themselves. Now we do know what other people are thinking and as there's positive feedback within social media that it kind of makes. So conspiracy theories, yeah, they're, they're everywhere. They're, they're very strong. Now, there's a part of it that, you know, Marx had that famous quote that religion is uh, the opium of the people. It's, it's the sigh of the oppressed. Um, you know, I don't want to um, bash religion here at all, but I think the point he's making is that um, religion is a kind of a attempt at a solution to the problem of evil in the world. And um, it's a way of um, giving us, us, us hope and giving us some feeling of control in what can be a very disturbing and confusing world. And the conspiracy theories, right, they're attractive because People know, as Chris said, I think at the beginning of our conversation, that something is up, something is wrong, something spiritually is, is corrupted about our system. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up. It's not good. And how do you explain that? Well, I think many of the conspiracy theor theories are simplistic answers to that question. They, they're easy to understand. Um, like sugar, easy to eat, easy to digest intellectually that seem to be satisfying, but actually a very poor nutrition. And people are attracted to them because it helps them to understand why they're getting stitched up and stiff by the system. So I have a lot of sympathy for people who have these kind of conspiracy theories. And the fact that they're so um, prevalent is a, is, a, is a sign of the failure, the failure of the uh, revolutionary left it is a sign. People shouldn't be having these kind of mad theories about lizards or UFOs or the Jews, etc. All these mad conspiracy theories about people who, you know, people who are controlling things behind the scenes because it's actually fundamentally not true. The problem is that people are not in control. People that we are not in control. No humans are really in control. It's a system that is out of control. Something else is control. It is in control, and it's um, this real god, this demonic entity that we have summoned into existence by our social practices unknowingly, and we're now subject to it. So, I think uh, Marx's theory and my elaboration of it is is like the antithesis of conspiracy theories in that sense. That definitely makes sense. <laughs> um, so if I can kind of send us off with another last question, um, I think I heard you say that our imagination hasn't caught up with our social practices. Does that sound right? Yeah, I did say that. Yeah. Do you think that it will? And what will that look like in the future? I mean, um, hmm. that's, a good, that's a very good question. Um, um, well, well, look, um, I don't know, but this is what I'd like to be the case. I'd I, I mean, I, I, I think we're. I think we have an incredible capacity to learn as human beings, right? And uh, that makes me very hopeful. Um, and I think the mere fact that we're talking in the way we have for the last hour or so shows that we are, I think, capable of us understanding the social realities that we collectively create and critiquing them and changing them. So in that sense, I'm extremely hopeful, but um, to put my um, sort of philosophy scientist hat on for a moment, this is a never ending journey, right? Once we abolish capitalism and replace it with something better, that is certainly not the end of history. And it's not the end of our understanding of ourselves, what we're capable of, or even the universe that we find ourselves in. We're still, we're still children in the universe. And that, that process is, is never gonna end of learning and finding out more. So um, we'll never get to an end point if, if that answers your question, I don't think. Just better uh, way, I think, <laughs> hopefully. Yeah, that was beautiful. Thank you.
one last thing uh, before we wrap up. Uh, do you have any plans uh, or, or any talks planned or uh, anything on your website that you want to tell us about that's coming up? Well, yeah, people, um, if people are interested in, in what we've discussed today, I'd encourage people to visit uh, my website. It's um, darkmarxism.online. And there's a bunch of my writings there, including um, essays on, on Marx's real God. I'm actually giving a talk, uh, which I haven't prepared for yet, in in about three days' time, on um, on a book written in the 1930s as a reaction to um, the Soviet system, um, a critique of it, called on the fundamental principles of communist production distribution. So, I've been reading that recently. I'm going to give a, a short talk on that, and then. Um, uh, secretly, I'm working on a book that I've been working on for probably the last 20 years, um, and it's very slow progress because um, I have to earn my wage, and um, people aren't going to pay me to talk about this kind of stuff. So, uh, but I'm I'm getting there. So, um, hopefully, watch this space. Maybe in some years' time, there'll be a book. It's exciting. Yeah, that's exciting. Well, I can't wait for the book. Uh, I know it, it may be, be it may be another ten years or five years or however long, but I'm excited for that. Uh, I'm excited to hear that talk as well. And I, I will have a link in the description for uh, your website and some of the specifically some of the works that we've talked about today. But I would encourage everybody to go read um, everything that's on Dark Marxism's website under uh, on on Ian Wright's website. Uh, it's all very good material, very informative. And uh, thank you all for listening. Uh, this has been great. Thank you, Ian, for joining us. Thanks to you both. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. This was amazing. Uh, it looks like good stuff on your whiteboard there. Very, very interesting. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm at my work office, so that's not me. That's a coworker. But uh, Very brave of you to be talking about Marxism at your work office. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. It's, it's totally dead and silent here, but yeah, on the weekend. And there you have it.